Hello and welcome to the Japan Zoominar at UC San Diego. Uh, I'm Ulrike Shader. I'm the director of JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology, which is at uh, GPS at the University of California in San Diego. GPS stands for Global School of Global Policy and Strategy. We are a graduate school uh, uh, that has an international relations and a public policy leg. Uh, we have, uh, as one of our degrees, a Master of International Affairs with a Japan specialization. If you're interested in our programs, please go to gps.ucsd.edu. At GPS, we have My Japan Center, which is a uh, place for research, education, information, and connections across the Pacific. If you're interested in uh, more of what we're doing, please go to jfit.ucsd.edu. I also have a website of my own, which is called thejapanologist.com, and it has a blog page. Um, at uh, JFET, we at the Japan Zuminar, uh, we cover a wide range of topics. And today, of course, uh, we'll talk about Ruth Benedict and the study of Japanese culture. If I lose you before you, uh, uh, before we uh, close up today, note that next week we'll switch topics ever so lightly. We'll go to robotics uh, <laughs> and uh, Japanese robots and the digital transformation of Japan, followed by a discussion of Japan's geoeconomic strategy. And then later in December, we'll look at Japanese business strategies. And with that, uh, let me stop my share and introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Amy Borovoy, who is a professor of East Asian Studies and Cultural Anthropology at Princeton University. Welcome, Amy. It's great to Thank have you. you. Let me uh, say a little bit about you first, uh, and then I'll hand the microphone over. So Amy uh, earned her undergraduate degree in psychology at Harvard and her MA and PhD uh, in anthropology at Stanford. Now you, that is that was one of the high towers of anthropology, anthropology studies of Japan, I guess. You must have studied with Tom Rolaine and Harumi Befu and uh, a whole host of wonderful people. Um, among Amy's publications, and there are many, uh, for me, the one that stands out is a book that she wrote in 2005 titled The Too Good Wife, Alcohol, Codependence, and the Politics of Nurturance in Post-War Japan. And that sounds like a scary title, but I have to tell you, I couldn't put it away. Uh, and I was actually, so I got codependent, I guess, on this book or something like that. It's a very interesting study. Uh, she's also worked on health issues like hikikomori, public health campaigns. Uh, the last time we met Amy, you were looking at this very interesting phenomenon that the US and Japan have fundamentally different approaches to treating kidney failure. Uh, and so maybe if that's of interest, we can get there later. You also have a paper on uh, Doi Takeo on Amai, the anatomy, the anatomy of Dependence, in the Journal of Japanese Studies, I believe it is. So today we want to talk about your current project, uh, which is tentatively titled A Living Laboratory, Japan and American Social Thought. And what you're doing there is you're going back to Ruth Benedict. Uh, uh, who in many ways laid the foundation on how we look at Japan and Japanese culture. And I just uh, used the occasion to go back and read that book again. And I have to say, it, it's, it looks, it's pretty tough at times and tense, and may, uh, there's, a, there's some claims in there one could fiddle with. But fundamentally, it is amazing how this book has shaped the discourse and how we look at Japan. So. Without further ado, let me hand the microphone over to you. And maybe you can give us a little bit of a glimpse into this book, which isn't done quite yet. Uh, so people can't buy it, but we'll whet their appetites anyway. So thank you, Amy, for joining me today. OK. Thank you very much, Ulrika, for having me. And um, it's, it's really wonderful, the, the Zoominar series that you've organized um, with JFIT. And I'm really pleased to be a part of it. Um, so. Excuse me. Um, I will follow Ulrika's lead and, and just lead into the topic of Ruth Benedict by saying a few things about um, the manuscript that I'm, I've been working on for uh, a number of years. And the tentative title is A Living Laboratory, Japan in American Social Thought. And the first chapter of the book uh, deals with Ruth Benedict's text, The Chrysanthemum and the Sword, which I think all of us here are to some extent familiar with. Um, so let me just go ahead and say a couple of words about 
I don't know, the place that I start in the book. And then I'd like to say uh, a little bit about what I've learned about Ruth Benedict. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, are we, are we okay, Ulrika? Okay, great. Um, well, when I have been talking about the book recently, I start with this sort of provocative image, um, which, which is from a Time Magazine issue that was published in 1981 called How Japan Does It. And so I'll just take you know a couple of minutes just as, as kind of a starting point, um, could start in a number of different places, but just to go back to the early 1980s when there was a lot of interest, excitement, and also you know, suspicion directed towards Japan um, in the United States. So here, one of the photos in the Time Magazine issue is, of course, Japanese automobiles, Datsuns being unloaded at the port of um, Newark. And I mean, it's just a, it's, it's a kind of interesting image. I would say it, it almost looks like an invading fleet with, you know, the tanker offshore and so forth. Um, so kind of threatening connotation, but also admiration. Um, here's what the, um, you know, print part of the magazine looked like. And when you get inside the issue, you see a lot of images that look like this, which are very admiring. And I would say almost wistful of um, you know, the assembly lines, the quality control, and on the left, a group of Fujitsu workers who were kind of you know, conferring intimately around a table. Um, this is an image of a wedding that is taking place at the Matsushita Electric um, Company's club. And the you know, Time Magazine tells us that um, the bride's Shinto um, headwear and, and robe and so forth, um, the rental probably would have been subsidized by Matsushita. So right away, we're, you know, seeing in this issue some kind of commentary on the fact that uh, Japanese companies behave differently from American companies and that these workers are in some ways being um, sort of cared for managed and trained in very intimate social ways. And on the right, we see um, retirees at Matsushita who are being retrained. So as a kind of starting point, I just find it really, I, I wanna just sort of step back and say that I find it really fascinating to think about the kind of role of Japan in American social thought over the course of the latter part of the 20th century, and just the very project of how another nation in in this case, Japan could occupy a kind of prominent role in the national imaginary of another country and the work that that imagination does. Um, what kinds of conversations did this lead to? How did it provoke Americans to think about themselves in different ways? And you know, what were some of the problems and limitations of those kinds of conversations? So in the book, I track several canonical texts in the field of Japan studies um, in the United States. And the first book that I tackle is Ruth Benedict's The Chrysanthemum and the Sword. Before I get to that, I just want to you know, show these images of, actually these are books that are in my used book collection of kind of mid 20th century American books about Japan. And you know we can kind of guffaw at the titles now, but I just want to kind of use these provocative covers to you know remind us all of the fact that um, when the war ended in 1945 and then beginning you know with the occupation from 45 to 52 and then onwards, there was this very kind of exciting sense that Japan was an important place to the United States, a special place to the United States, and also kind of an experiment for the United States, that the United States had gotten involved in Japan in a very intimate way in the context of the war and then the occupation. And, you know, just to kind of take us back that a lot was riding on what the outcome of this transformation of Japan or democratization of Japan would look like. Of course, it was a time when you know, I don't think I need to remind everyone that, um, you know, the war had concluded, the Cold War was beginning, and, you know, Japan was really this kind of interesting test case 
um, would the Japanese accommodate American democratizing reforms? Would there be a communist revolution? Um, and, you know, really sort of big questions about um, sort of what the future of the good society would look like. Um, so Japan was really kind of at the heart of those conversations right from the start of the mid 20th century. And I think it's a really provocative story to go back and revisit. And that's what I'm hoping to do uh, in my book. So let me just say a few things about Ruth Benedict. And I prepared about 20 minutes of comments. I hope that's not overkill, but I will be succinct. Um, so I just want to launch right in and then I'll say a few things about the book, many of which I think, you know, people here are familiar with. But, you know, right from the start, Ruth Benedict is um, announcing to us that she is well aware of the nature of the experiment that the United States is undergoing with Japan. Um, she understood that when she began research on Japan in 1944, and one of the very first passages of the book, you know, tells us that um, a lot is at stake in understanding the Japanese. So page three, she says, crises were facing us in quick succession. What would the Japanese do? Was capitulation possible without invasion? Should we bomb the emperor's palace? What could we expect of Japanese prisoners of war? When peace came, were the Japanese a people who would require perpetual martial law to keep them in order? Would our army have to prepare to fight desperate bitter enders in every mountain fastness of Japan? Would there have to be a revolution in Japan after the order of the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution before international peace was possible? Who would lead it? Was the alternative eradication of the Japanese? It made a great deal of difference what our judgments were. So, of course, uh, many of you know that Ruth Benedict was working for the US government when she wrote the first version of the Chrysanthemum and the Sword, which was entitled Report Number 25, submitted to the Office of War Information um, in the early summer of 1945. Um, she began doing research for the Office of War Information in June 1944. And she only began working full time for the OWI in September of 1944 on Japan. Um, the Chrysanthemum and the Sword is a text that has been widely read and commented upon and critiqued. And you know, one of the things I want to say today is that I think there's still room for rereading. But I first want to acknowledge that it is a book that we know well and. Um, has received a good deal of commentary. And some of, some of the commentary, I, I feel that the commentary has been in some ways, um, to use the word somewhat inappropriately, schizophrenic. So that on the one hand, we have, you know, sort of the Ruth Benedict fans who believe that the book was very, um, really expressed a kind of anthropologist tolerance and openness to a different society and kind of an expression of the notion of um, cultural relativism. Clifford Geertz would fall into that camp and many other commentators as well. And then I would say starting in the 1980s, 1990s, you have more critical commentary coming from the post-colonial perspective, which is taking Benedict to task for, you know, absolutely being a handmaiden to the US government, for being on board with the agenda of uh, occupation and democratization. And of course, for, as you know, Ulrika Sheda said in her introduction, for you know, floating out some fairly simplistic, sometimes kind of schematic um, notions about Japanese society. I don't, I don't use this book when I teach my Japanese society and culture class. I do use it when I teach about the history of understanding Japan, but we wouldn't use it today. And I think all of you know that, of course, Benedict was what's often called an armchair anthropologist. She never visited Japan. She had no prior expertise in Japan. Um, she didn't speak Japanese and she wrote the Chrysanthemum and the Sword entirely based on secondary sources. So, we have these kind of two um, bodies of uh, sort of commentary, one positive, one fairly negative. And I would like to say that I think there's still room for 
something in between. I don't think that we've really necessarily gotten to the bottom of what Benedict is doing in this text and what it is that she wants to persuade the United States government and her American readers of. In the end, I guess I'd like to just start by saying that I think we should probably let go of the idea that she was a kind of perfect cultural relativist in the traditional sense and just right away kind of accept and buy into the critique that yes, she was working for the US government. Yes, she believed in the democratization of Japan. So to, if we're imagining cultural relativism as a kind of moral relativism, like any society is acceptable, any body of moral values is equally acceptable to any other, then she was not, um, she was not a good cultural relativist. At the same time, I can't accept, and I, I find little evidence to accept, the, the sort of strong critique that um, what she wanted to, was to kind of wipe out Japanese culture and replace it with American liberal democracy and American individualism. And I think there's quite a bit of evidence in the text which suggests to the contrary. And so I guess in the course of the next few slides that I'm going to show you, I'm, I'm going to try and just give you a sense of how it was that she's trying to sort of thread her way in between. Because in the end of both report number 25 and um, the Chrysanthemum and the Sword, Benedict makes a very strong, explicit case that the United States probably can build a democracy on the foundations of received cultural traditions in Japan. Of course, it's well known that she argued in favor of keeping the emperor as um, as a sovereign, as a as a figure um, head in Japan, if not a political leader. Um, and so she makes a very kind of passionate case at the end of the chrysanthemum and the sword that the occupation should embrace tolerance, that it should be gentle, and that we don't need to see a kind of rewriting or an eradication of fundamental core beliefs in order to build democracy in Japan. So how does she go about making that case? I think it's a really interesting question. And to answer the question, <clears throat> of course, I reread the text many times. And in addition, I've made several visits to, <coughs> excuse me. I've also made um, several visits to the Ruth Fulton Benedict papers, which are at Vassar College, where her own documents are archived and um, where the documents or many of the documents that she used to write the chrysanthemum and the sword are held. So I've reviewed the materials that she was reading in order to make her statement about what are the Japanese like. So I didn't want to say three things about what it is that I'd like you to take away from what I've learned. Um, and the first is that throughout the Chrysanthemum and the Sword, Benedict insists that the reason the Japanese behave the way they do is not because of race, and it's not even be, it's not because of fundamental political beliefs that they hold, but rather it's because they've been persuaded to. Benedict's interest as an anthropologist in mid-century and as a student of Franz Boas was in learned behavior. And I think it needs to be explored more carefully the very, um, uh, intense way in which she engaged with that idea in the chrysanthemum and the sword of, you know, cultural behavior as learned behavior. And her sources, which I'm going to show you um, a, a few of today, um, make it very clear that that was one of her concerns. So Japanese political social behavior is learned behavior. Of course, the implication there is that it can be changed. Um, also, what she does in the chrysanthemum and the sword is to distance what she sees as traditional cultural behavior, filial piety, um, a strong adherence to local governance, um, em emperor reverence, and so forth, to distance those patterns of behavior from something that we might call fanaticism, 
or fascism. And I just, here's an image of um, Ruth Benedict and I wanna show you report number 25. So this is what report number 25 looked like. Um, the cover is on the left and on the right, um, we see the table of contents. And you can see that the very, you know, after the introduction on page two, the first heading in the table of contents is, are the Japanese fatalistic? And I think it's not a coincidence that that is her first heading. Um, that was really the kind of million dollar question that Benedict was facing. In other words, would the Japanese do what um, American war propaganda and some American intelligence had suggested they would, which is kind of march down the barrel of a gun, refuse to surrender, you know, hold out their loyalty for the emperor as sovereign, et cetera, et cetera, rebel against the occupation, or would they come around? Would they be open to political change? Um, could they let go of these beliefs? And it's really that question that Benedict's holding in her heart. Her answer is that no, they are not fatalistic. And part of the way she answers that question is to argue that uh, Japanese culture is learned. And part of the way she does it, and I guess this is kind of my third point, is to show that some of these beliefs around family, emperor, and so forth are actually not, uh, um, you know, that we can look upon these beliefs in a more favorable way. And she wants to show us how we might understand them as reasoned, principled, and even compelling in some ways. So let me just give you a sense of um, what I found in the archives. Say a couple of, I'm going to move fairly quickly now, um, throw out a couple of thoughts that link Benedict to my other work in the book, and then I'd like to open to questions. Okay. So I just want to remind, uh, you know, I, there are probably some anthropologists. I know there are some anthropologists in the room tonight, um, but not everyone. So, you know, The Chrysanthemum and the Sword was an important book to American readers, but an even more important book that Benedict wrote was called Patterns of Culture, which was actually a national bestseller that was published in 1933. And the argument of patterns of culture really encapsulated kind of one of the main directions of American anthropology in the mid 20th century, which was to argue against race and to argue against genetic determinism and instead to argue for culture as um, an environmental learned behavior that comes from nurture, not nature. So Benedict says on page 11, the queen ant removed to a solitary nest will produce each trait of sex behavior, each detail of the nest. The social insects represent nature in a mood when she was taking no chances. For better or worse, man's solution lies at the opposite pole. Not one item of his tribal social organization, of his language, of his local religion is carried in his germ cell. In other words, ant's behavior is genetically determined, human behavior is not. Um, and she says, now this is from report number 25 on Japan um, from 1945. On the very first page, she's repeating her oath from patterns of culture. The methods used in the study are those of cultural anthropology. It regards mankind wherever found as having basically similar potentialities, but stresses that man's supreme achievement has been his plasticity. He learns his way of life from his earliest infancy by those who surround him and by the social institutions under which he lives. Differences in, his, in these influences produce national or regional ways of viewing their own selves, the universe and their relations to their fellow man. So essentially as an anthropologist, her creed is that behavior is culturally shaped. And this idea very much um, was simpatico with American occupation era goals because of course the agenda was to <clears throat> remake Japan by remaking Japanese institutions. And so Benedict's idea that you know Japanese people, that behavior is the result of education um, was a very important message for them to receive and, and you know, a heartening one. I want to just give you a sense of the kinds of documents that are in the archives. And this, I'm sorry, this is such a poor um, photograph. I think I, um, I think I just screenshotted 
a PDF of a document, but I just want to give you the sense in, in this case, um, this is um, a translation of uh, part one and part two of an ethics textbook for Japanese elementary schools. And it says in parentheses, as of 1936. So Benedict is reading translations of what, for example, young Japanese children are being taught to believe about, <clears throat> about the emperor, about the state, about society and so forth in elementary school. And her own comments um, on these documents note what I have on the right, Japanese schools go much further than American schools in making all courses contribute to the moral education of the child. <clears throat> the relationship between the ethics course and the other courses is very close. Benedict also had, I'm gonna move quickly, but Benedict also had a number of, I was fascinated to see that she had a number of transcripts of interviews with captured POWs. These were being translated um, by the US Office of War Information. And of course their intelligence went to her. She was very interested in the question of, you know, how these POWs would act under duress. Would they hold to their beliefs about Japan and the emperor? <laughs> you don't have to read this carefully, but in this case, um, this private um, Shoji Suetsugu, Suetsugu Shoji was captured in Burma is saying, I can't go back to Japan. If I surrender, I will no longer be Japanese. But Benedict was also really interested in moments that she found, and she has extensive annotations on these documents where the POWs would turn and they would agree to help the American government or they would express ambivalence about the Japanese army, about even their immediate superiors in the military, about the viability of Japan's imperial ambitions and so forth. Um, so that was also something that was influencing her about, you know, um, this idea that um, behavior is fluid, cultural behavior is learned and it's fluid. Um, I wanna point out too that one of the um, important pieces of work that Benedict does in the Chrysanthemum and the Sword, I think, is to talk about these social influences, the influence of family, nation, local government, schools, and so forth in a more benevolent way. So in other words, we can understand Japanese um, submission or capitulation to these sort of rigorous codes of behavior um, to, uh, you know, the exhortation to sacrifice for the sake of the nation as actually coming from a kind of more compelling place. In other words, it's not just blind obedience. And here she's talking about ancestor worship. And she makes an argument that actually has been repeated in the post-war study of ancestor worship by scholars such as David Plath and Robert J. Smith, who undertook much more extensive studies. But Benedict was really, I think, insightful in her claim that ancestor worship is really misnamed. It shouldn't be called ancestor and it shouldn't be called worship because she reminds the reader that the most common way that Japanese families pay reverence to their, um, their predecessors is in an is in, in intimate way um, revering and, pay, and sort of uh, engaging in memorial rites for those who, who are more immediately departed, those who they remember, the more immediately recently deceased kin, rather than this kind of anonymous category of ancestors. So she says, in Japan, there is no cult of veneration of remote ancestors. Filial piety is rooted in intimacy, familiarity, and love. Citizens gather to worship at the local shrine, so they may gather there, but loyalty to ancestors is paid at, she says, quite a different place in the family living room, where among all classes, a daily ritual is performed and food is set out for parents and grandparents and close relatives remembered in the flesh. So I think quite a more intimate portrait of this culture of filial piety ancestor worship and so forth, that had been blamed for so, ma so much harm. And for, of course, um, American observers was closely linked to emperor worship, the ideology of, you know, the Japanese nation as having divine roots um, and so on and so forth. 
Um, Benedict, I'm not going to read through all this, but Benedict also makes the point that um, emperor worship, quote unquote, is immediately um, that what, what informs and motivates emperor worship is love for family. And so she really takes the idea of reverence for the emperor down to a much more I immediate kind of intimate level. Um, she talks about a sense of duty or own that one has to one's mother. Um, it refers to all that a mother has done for a baby and all the sacrifices she has made. And then she concludes, modern Japan has used every means to center this sentiment upon the emperor. Every partiality they have for their own way of living increases each man's imperial own. Every cigarette distributed to the army on the front lines in the emperor's name during the war underscored the own each soldier wore for him. Every sip of sake doled out to them before going into battle was further imperial on. So kind of taking this sort of forbidding idea of emperor worship and you know, bringing it down to a much more intimate level. And I think here she's really building on what um, many American observers, even in the US government understood about Japan, which was that the emperor as a figure of worship was a social construction and that it did come partly from, you know, discourses and texts like the Imperial Rescript for Education, Kokutai no Hongi, and so forth, um, that Japanese people were educated to believe. The last um, slide I want to show is Benedict's attention to child rearing. And, you know, for those of you who haven't read the book or haven't read this section, I'd really recommend it because I would say it's one of the few sections in the book that really does, is it's more ethnographic and is more based on, I think, interviews Benedict was conducting with um, Japanese Americans who were in Washington. And it feels more ethnographic. And it's a very um, powerful statement that she's making about how Japanese children are socialized. But the last chapter is a very important part of the book because the title is The Child Learns. And the implication, I think, I think it's a pretty thinly veiled, you know, reference to the fact that the United States will most likely defeat and occupy Japan. Well, they, they had already done so at the point that, you know, she's writing the last sections of Chrysanthemum and the Sword. And so The Child Learns refers to the Japanese under the American occupation. And what she talks about in the chapter is the very physical and immediate ways in which the child is kind of molded and sculpted. That was the reference to the chrysanthemum in the title. And you can see just from this little clip in the traditional teaching of writing to the instructor took the child's hand and made the ideographs. It was to give him the feel. The child learned to experience the controlled rhythmic movements before he could recognize the characters, much less write them. So here I just want to say that, you know, she's, she's doing a couple of things. She's telling us that the Japanese are moldable, that what they do, they have learned in intimate ways, and that the United States can remold them. But she's also telling us that the way in which they learn, the institutions they're surrounded by, schools, families, and so forth, are not purely malevolent and that there are compelling aspects. You know, she talks about filial piety as a kind of care and that people submit to it because they understood they understand they're also being protected. I was telling um, Professor Shada when we were talking to get ready for the webinar that throughout the book, I, I still need to actually count these references, but I would say there are probably eight or nine times in the Chrysanthemum and the Sword where she compares Japan to Germany and tells us that you know, she uses Germany as this kind of foil and she tells us that Japanese behave the way they do because of this kind of soft socialization, which is in part benevolent. And she holds up this kind of stiff, stereotypical German counter image, which is that, you know, the Germans behave, I have, I have a quote that I can show later if someone's interested, but the Germans behave the way they do because they're autocratic it's a dictatorial culture with strong patriarchy that can't be resisted um, and people just have to blindly submit. So she's telling us that that's not the case with Japan. And I think that her attention to the social in Japan is really for me kind of the bridge to some of the other texts that I treat in the book that 
you know, she starts in in 1944 with this problem on her hands about what Americans are going to do with Japan. And I think in the end, she uses her expertise as an anthropologist in pretty sophisticated ways to show us that not only does she believe the Japanese can come around, but that some of the ways in which their society is organized is actually not so unreasonable. Um, and it's this idea that, you know, people are kind of molded, they're taught, that I think for Benedict is a really important part of her politics. In her archives, I found a number of her writings on American democracy. I guess I would just say in closing that I think it's important to remember, and I, I don't think this has gotten enough treatment in Benedictology, if I can invent a word, that Benedict came of age in the progressive era in the United States. She was a New Deal liberal, a New Deal Democrat, um, and she had socialist leanings. She was not, I don't think, a member of the American Communist Party, and neither was Franz Boas, her mentor, but they were active in political groups and scholarly groups where um, members of the Communist Party were active. And, you know, the Communist Party was still a somewhat present part of American politics at that time. And Benedict's sympathies, <coughs> quite frankly, lay in the direction of a society shaped by social institutions. She was not averse to the idea of, of um, you know, a strong state or family hierarchy. And the text that I'm showing in the right is one of the essays that she published in the 1930s on a collection on the American family. And she's very critical of the, um, the family genus Americanus. She says that individualism is not a ticket to happiness, that um, Americans don't, American families are left to struggle on their own because we don't have good social welfare. We refuse to pay taxes. And that the American family, she says, is peculiarly non-authoritarian. Um, she talks about American housewives, for example, as having privileges without responsibilities and so on and so forth. So in the conclusion of the chapter, I think I, I just want to kind of remind readers that although Japan seemed very far off and these ethics of filial piety, emperor worship, and so forth were forbidding, um, in kind of making a case for the social treatment of individuals and the sort of forceful operations of the social on the person in Japanese society, you know, those ideas were partly sympathetic with her own politics in the United States and elsewhere. The last thing I prepared was just a sense of where I'm going, but I, I think I'm just going to stop there. And I can make some connections to the rest of the book or not, um, as people like, but I think it makes sense to, you know, hear people's questions. Well, thank you very much. Can you uh, find the stop button for the sharing? Perfect. Uh, let's see, it should be like this. That's good. I don't have, uh... all right, so here we are. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a couple of questions on the admin side. So you, uh, audience, or feel free to type in some uh, Q&A here. And um, if you missed out the beginning of this, or your email went out, or you couldn't uh, be here today, or your friends couldn't be here today, there's a taped version that will go up as early as tomorrow. Uh, go to jfit.ucsd.edu slash Zoominar and uh, it will be there. So you can re-watch re this or tell your friends. So uh, Amy, thank you very much. Uh, you've answered already one of our questions, which was by uh, John Treat, who, who says, isn't it time for a rediscovery of, of, you know, isn't, there used to be this passage that every Japanologist had to go through and say, Ruth Benedict was wrong. And so you did a wonderful way of telling us that maybe let's, uh, let's go back and, and look at what she actually had to say. And I did this in preparation of our meeting today. And I have to say, I'm actually thinking of assigning uh, a chapter or two uh, of the book um, to my class because it also tells us a lot about the United States. 
uh, in in the in the forties and fifties, right? And sort of um, you know the this was about conquering Japan, and and I was quite struck by how how well she actually captured a lot of the Japanese uh, uh, behaviors and uh, how true some of those are still today, right? So, so why, um, why, why did you, why are you interested in this topic? Why are you, what, what's driving you to, to get to the, to the root of these questions? Hmm, that's interesting. I, I was also curious to hear, was the question from John posted here? Uh, yeah, so what he said is like, Oh, hi, um, I see it. Can so, I read it? Um, it's, it's, it's by and large the same critique all the time. We say, you know, she didn't know what she was talking about, or, you know, it's not right, or it's, it's overdrawn. And so there's this disavowal of her work that's sort of a required passage of all Japan anthropologists in training. Um, but, but is this now being rediscovered, or is it just you who are interested in it? And, and, and I think that's why we're here, right? So that's, John, you asked the question of why are we here? Why did I invite Amy? And you know, and I write about tight loose culture in my own book. I think I think it's time we have mm. made enough progress uh, in being more sophisticated around what is culture and how it can be used uh, and put to great effect in terms of understanding better of how places are different and, and how we can do research about them, right? So, uh, and so that's why that's, that triggered my question. So what, what, is your, what is your motivation in bringing her back? Yeah, I like that question a lot. Um, well, I think, <clears throat> I think I'll start with big and go small, but um, I think we could have this conversation on the level of just even thinking about the relevance of Japan to Americans because I think that um, we've been through so so many twists and turns and contortions from kind of um, a fascination that was perhaps a little naive to um, you know texts that were published that were just kind of dramatically oversimplistic. Um, and then a response to those texts, which was very vehement. And I feel like um, it's, it's easy to, to sort of uh, lose track and, and kind of, it's easy to throw out the baby with the bathwater when we think about why Japan might be interesting to us still. Um, you know, certain people, certain scholars' exuberance draws disproportionate critique, and then it feels like there's no way forward. Um, and I think Ruth Benedict is an example of that. I mean, um, you know, I think part of what, um, I, I, I felt that immediately when I was reading sort of the kind of critiques of her work in the 1980s and 1990s, that one way forward was to simply acknowledge that, you know, it's not surprising that um, her, her ideas are uh, uh, conducive to US government agendas. We have to acknowledge that. Um, she was overly, you know, she was essentializing. She created broad statements about Japanese society that don't apply to everyone. I mean, I think there's an, um, a certain amount of critique that we can just grant, but sometimes the critique blinds us to looking more closely at what she was actually doing. And I think that going to the archives um, you know, we had Clifford Geertz in the 1980s in the context of his book, Works and Lives, making a very positive case for Benedict, but kind of in the vein of cultural relativism saying, like, isn't it remarkable that, you know, Benedict is critical, is, that she's holding up Japan as this kind of window into the United States, and she's often critical of the United States. Um, but I think it was really going to the archives. Um, that really helped me see, wow, uh, this is a scholar. 
I felt like I was reliving Benedict's experience putting the book together. And, you know, it, it made me think, you know, that a lot of the criticism that's been directed at her is she never went there. She didn't speak Japanese. She had no Japan expertise, et cetera, et cetera, all true. But if you think about the chrysanthemum and the sword as, um, I mean, actually, I think the way we should approach the book is not as a flawed classic, but rather as what it was, kind of an occasional book, a book written for a specific occasion. To make a policy statement under very um, constrained circumstances, and if we think about the book in that context and work backwards and think about how she arrived at this really interesting, thoughtful, insightful, and quite compassionate rendering of Japanese culture, I found myself really in awe of her intellect. Yeah, I completely sh share that. Uh, I mean, give her credit that she couldn't go to Japan. It's not that she didn't want to or was lazy or anything, mm -hmm. quite to the opposite. This is yeah, a very yeah. carefully done work. And there's a lot in there also about the Meiji period mm -hmm. that is actually spot on. Um, <laughs> and uh, she has industrial policy laid out there. Uh, and right, how that's Meiji true. Would not, would not, uh, not, not leave industrial development to supply and demand or the vagaries of the market, she writes, right? There is a spot for everybody and there's a spot for large companies and small companies. She even explains why Japan has a hard time with entrepreneurship because there's a hierarchy and the hierarchy has a function. And she explains the logic of all of that. But I do want to go back to the um, I mean, so, so in, a, in a way, reading this book is actually kind of a place for self-reflection. You learn a lot about yourself actually reading it. And so that makes it interesting. But I want to go back to this Germany thing, not because I'm German, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but because it really struck me as interesting. And that what I'm, it's what I meant when I said we learned a lot about the U.S. at the time. The U.S. really... Um, I mean, so, so in a way, the, the way she treats Germany contradicts her own story, right? So she has the theory that behavior is learned and because behavior is learned, it can be unlearned. And so everybody can be a better person or worse person, you know, or a, a crazy person for a while or something. And, uh, and yet she doesn't seem to give Germany that chance. Right, so, um, and there's another book by her, another report by her on Germany, where she's very critical and very, you know, the Germans are just crazy people. And, um, yeah. and uh, partially true, I guess, at the time. Uh, my husband might think that that's still true, but, um, but, but for Japan, she's very benevolent. She says that, you know, uh, you know, you can change them. It comes from a good spot. She really likes Japan. She's really into it in a way, right? But isn't that a contradiction in her own kind of work? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I can address this question in as a sophisticated way as I would like to, because I think I need to know more about the United States during wartime. I think it has to do with American stereotypes of Germany during that time. I think it also just has to do with kind of good old-fashioned Orientalism that the, you know, she, the, I guess the Americans saw the Japanese as more sort of dominatable. And, you know, the, there were a lot of infantilizing images associated with Japan during the occupation. I mean, her title, The Child Learns, you know, resonates with those. Um, and, you know, feminized images, which we, we didn't have of the Germans. Um, so there's probably a really interesting answer there that could come from a historian or somebody who's, you know, following the United States during that time. But from my perspective, I just felt like she kind of, it really offered me, nobody's commented on that aspect of the book. And it was another window into how concerned she was to highlight the way in which social institutions, sociality in Japan, could be seen as more benevolent. Uh, Michelle Gaffant has a question. She's looked at Japan uh, uh, from an anthropology perspective. And um, so she wonders whether you find indications of tight, loose, and, um, and it, it does, does she kind of go there in the sense that, I mean, uh, the, the rigidities, I guess, she talks about a little bit, right? So she has something about everybody has a place. Everybody has a place in the hierarchy. 
she goes in, in great length into the, the on and the giri and the gimu and all of these various, very complicated uh, ways of thinking that she portrays as being just the opposite of how Americans think about something, right? And so that, that makes it very interesting. But do you see evidence of tight and loose in, in this work? Well, that's a question for you too, I think, because, you know, we are, you know, obviously she didn't use that language and it's always difficult to, you know, um, make statements about society and culture that endure for 50 years. But I think the tight loose notion is in the way that you use it in your work, Ulrika, is very powerful. So I would actually be interested to hear from you. I mean, do you feel, is, are there, um, is there a premonition of that or are there resonances there? I, I found, so I marked, as I was reading it, I marked little passages where she says, <laughs> well, Americans would never uh, bend to this uh, rigidity or Americans would never uh, do it in this way because all Japanese are like this. And so, and, and every Japanese, and, and you know, every cigarette that's handed to a soldier is a gift from the emperor and it's like this. And, and what we used to, I think, also back to John's question, I think what we, we used to read this and I say, well, that's totally overdrawn. How can she say every and how can she say it's so rigorous? But if we look at it again from, from today's perspective, I read it was a completely different, through a completely different lens. And I saw a lot of these differentiations that she was also partially saying, hey, Americans, as you go to Japan to occupy this country, don't judge too soon. Don't use your own uh, loose um, assumptions of what are the right behaviors in a certain situation and don't interpret Japanese behavior as malign or belligerent or whatever you might, fanatic, you know, whatever negative word, try to see it through their lens and you see that um, there's a reason why they're behaving that way and it is kind of learned behavior. And so if you understand them, you can work with them. And that's of course, exactly what happened, right? So the influence of Benedict on what happened in, in during the Japanese, the, the occupation of Japan is astounding, I would think. Right. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And there's there's a comment too from the audience, um, Robert Feldman, MacArthur lost popularity in Japan in the mid 1950s when he said in congressional testimony that German that the Germans were adults and therefore responsible for their wartime behavior, but the Japanese were still 12 year olds and thus not responsible. The chapter about education and chrysanthemum and swords suggests that Benedict was of the same opinion true. Well, I think that's really interesting. G great historical detail there. Um, I think Benedict was a little more nuanced than that. I mean, she calls the chapter The Child Learns, but it actually is an ethnography of child rearing in Japan. She knows quite a bit. Um, and I think partly what she's doing in that chapter is making the case against race and racial determinism for Japanese culture, which was a very important battle that American anthropologists were fighting at that time. Um, a book that was recently published called Gods of the Upper Air uh, by a historian goes back and this also tr um, addresses John Treat's question, goes back and treats this moment of Boazian anthropology in the mid 20th century. And it's really interesting book to me too, because it it's it's celebrate it's celebrative it's a celebrative treatment of american anthropology in mid 20th century saying that these kind of maverick anthropologists um who came from their own kind of idiosyncratic backgrounds i mean benedict had a had a kind of idiosyncratic past she was unhappy in her marriage she was partly deaf um various other things and um that they helped make the case for Americans and, and <clears throat> anthropologists, sociologists as well, that behavior, social behavior is not genetic. Um, so let me, so this is a big question, but it's an important one and we have to address it before we close. Uh, Alice reminds me to please ask you, um, shame and guilt. 
Right. So, um, yes, yeah, so you're making a funny face, but, but this is the, this is the word, right? That everybody attributes to the book that Japan is a shame culture. And part of the, the, the issues that we had with this book in the eighties was that that was overdrawn and that was, a, you know, applied in simplistic ways to certain behaviors. Um, I, in my book, got, got back to the shaming because we have now, um, partially that came out of the Kahneman work, uh, partially came out of uh, uh, behavioral economics, that nudging and shaming are actually really powerful ways to regulate or, or incentivize behavior without having to use more autocratic, you know, rule-based uh, laws or prescriptions or, you know, you must not. And so um, if we can nudge people to voluntarily do a certain behavior, we get a much better outcome. And so shaming uh, is actually a very powerful tool. And guilting, which is sort of the German, uh, the alleged German way, which I actually know, I'm not sure, but maybe that's true, um, is sort of the opposite way, right? You do something and you do it wrong and then, you know, it puts you on a guilt trip. Can you just uh, sort of, uh, in pulling this together, uh, maybe uh, talk a little bit about Japan as a shame place? Is, is, that, is there something to that? How do, how do anthropologists think about that? Yeah, that's a kind of thorny issue around Ruth Benedict because the um, passage or passages where she discusses shame culture are actually just, you know, I think it's like a page out of a 300 page book, but that got a lot of attention. And I think that the way that a lot of American critics heard that is that um, Ruth Benedict thinks that Japanese people have no conscience they just obey whatever their social context is telling them to do. And I think that's kind of the crude reading of that. So like they don't have guilt because guilt operates on your conscience. And, and, and instead they just bow to whatever, whatever the immediate environment is telling them to do. But actually I think Benedict's rendering is much richer than that. I think that shame culture for her was just one moment of many where she was trying to help realize for American readers how Japanese behavior was shaped by social institutions and by other people and dominant beliefs and ideologies. And in a sense, by showing the reader in such vivid, persuasive ways how that was being done in Japan, she was showing the American readers that they had a conscience. In other words, shame for her was a moral code. It wasn't just obedience. And I think that in rendering it so vividly, she was, you know, shame was really just kind of an index for a much broader picture that she was hoping to paint, which is that people don't just submit, actually. Um, it has to be persuasive. And I, I just think it's fascinating that um, you know, right at the mo a moment in American anthropology when um, anthropologists are really getting interested in kind of richly portraying the case of, for nurture and culture as socially shaped, Benedict happens to study Japan and Japan becomes this incredible laboratory, I think, for her to think about how society shapes behavior. I mean, if you're interested in how society shapes behavior, imagine stumbling upon Japan in 1944. And I think that that is really kind of a connection also to some of the other questions that uh, I know we won't have time to address them, but some of the listeners have been posing, like, how does this, you know, relate to corporate behavior or the company's invocation of family um, in its ideologies or like the writing that Matsushita Konosuke was doing for PHP in the 1950s and 60s. I mean, all of these examples are ways in which Japanese institutions um, in invoke society and social care to shape and mold behavior and to enfranchise people or solicit them into behaving in certain ways. And that has both positive and negative consequences. We know that it can be exploitative and fearful. And, we, and I think that one of the interesting things that anthropologists have done over the past 50 years is also show how um, it doesn't necessarily have to be fearful and autocratic. And so I, I think 
the ability that Benedict had in 1944 is really uncanny and other anthropologists followed to sort of make the case in a sense for society to Americans that society, social pressure, social influence, social institutions are not only oppressive. They can also be formative or enlivening or caring or what have you. And I think that has kind of been the battle that Japanologists have had to fight in the latter part of the 20th century is to make the case for the social to American readers who, particularly during the Cold War, ha have regarded it as oppressive and with a great deal of, of skepticism. So I think it's, it's fair to say that to this day, uh, Japan is a great place to study because, and that's probably part of the reason why you're going back into these old, older writings to, to review, because it is a, a, an alternative way of structuring society and it's an alternative way of structuring behavior and some of it strikes us as weird or you know some is like admirable but it is different and it is not that it's worse or better or stranger or more normal it is just different and it is in the differences that we gain some really important insights into how companies are managed or how people behave or uh, how outcomes are shaped and can be shaped, right? And so that's why this is such a great topic. Alas, uh, mm -hmm. time is up. So uh, thank you very much, Amy, for joining us today. And uh, allow me to uh, bring my PowerPoints up. Uh, announce that next week we have Alberto Moel uh, here, who is the VP of Strategy and Partnerships of Vio Robotics. And many of you may know Alberto as a long-standing Japan expert. He has been uh, an advisor and consultant with Monitor Group in Japan for many years and also an institutional uh, and, and investment securities analyst. So uh, please join us next week. Those of you who asked uh, where can you find the recordings, please go to jfit.ucsd.edu and follow the various links to the Zoominar series and you will find uh, links to past uh, show recordings there. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, stay healthy, stay well, and we'll see you next week, hopefully. Thank you very much, and goodbye. <laughs>